Welcome to our Wolf Education Center. We are indebted to our community with without uh, the generosity of our friends and neighbors of the community, this new cancer center, and then in particular this very special education center would not have been possible. We thank in particular the Wolf family who's, uh, for whom this center is named, but really our, our debt is for our entire community who really came to support and make this new cancer center uh, possible. We're excited to uh, open this, our for opening night, for those of you who may have noticed some of the black and white photos that are on the wall as you, as you come in or go out. Uh, those are all taken and donated by uh, staff at the Cancer Center. Some of them are quite remarkable, and you might take a look as you, uh, if you didn't see it on the way in as you, as you go out. This is, a, um, this is our opening night for our education series. We've been looking forward to doing this for quite a while. There's something very appropriate about making, about the subject for, for tonight's presentation. You know, we've, when, we, when we look back over the last generations of, of doctors and patients, one of the things that you can't help but be struck by is just the incredible array of approaches to the management of cancer that are available to patients and, and doctors and staff now that, that weren't available in previous generations. But one thing that has not changed, and that is that the most effective approach to cancer management is to prevent it from happening in the first place. And that is a theme that we take for granted now. Uh, but uh, but as, as some of you know, um, as much as our country has been a remarkable leader in the development of new cancer therapies. We have not necessarily always been a remarkable leader in the development of preventative medicine. And one of the very special things about having Dr. Peter Greenwald with us is that he, for those of us who have, who, who are familiar with the journey that our National Cancer Institute uh, and other centers of, of education and learning around the country have been involved in, uh, Dr. Greenwald is, uh, as 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 you'll see, is is kind of the one of those people that, during his professional lifetime, has really watched the evolution of the science. I have to say, it was a few years ago that we were uh, fortunate enough to recruit Dan Greenwald to come to Santa Barbara from Stanford uh, to join our cancer center. I remember he came by uh, one Saturday and said, "Hey, my parents are going to come by." Uh, just to see where I work now, and I said, "Oh, that's really nice." Um, <laughs> and then, and then, sure enough, doc, uh, Dan's parents came by, and and Dan came up and said, "I'd like you to meet my dad, uh, Peter Greenwald." And I and and it suddenly like clicked, like it, you could question my judgment as to why it didn't click until then, but then I suddenly realized this isn't Peter Greenwald. This is the Peter Greenwald. I wanted to um, just take a minute before, I actually want to just take a minute and show a video before we actually, before I introduce a cascade of Greenwalds. I'll introduce Dan, who will introduce his dad. But before I do that, I wanted to show a video, just a reminder to all of us of um, where this country has been when it comes to preventative medicine. So let me just run that video and then I'll ask Dan to come out and introduce his dad. You know, if you were to follow a busy doctor as he makes his daily round of calls, you'd find yourself having a mighty busy time keeping up with him. Time out for many men of medicine usually means just long enough to enjoy a cigarette. And because they know what a pleasure it is to smoke a mild, good-tasting cigarette, they're particular about the brand they choose. In a repeated national survey, doctors in all branches of medicine, doctors in all parts of the country were asked, what cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. 
Yes, according to this repeated nationwide survey, more doctors smoke camels than any other cigarette. Why not change to camels for the next 30 days and see what a difference it makes in your smoking enjoyment? See how camels agree with your throat. See how mild and good tasting a cigarette can be. Thank you. Thanks for coming this evening. Uh, as I've been joking with many of you over the last few weeks, you're about to get a preview of what I'm, what I'm going to look like in 37 years. Um, <clears throat> so, of course, it's a great joy to introduce my father, uh, Peter Greenwald. Uh, as Dr. Cass explained, he's director of the uh, Division of Prevention and Control at the National Cancer Institute for close to four decades. Uh, this evening, he's going to give you an overview of his career and his research field and the accomplishments at the NCI over those 35 to 40 years. When he arrived at NCI, the whole field of, of cancer prevention was really in its infancy. And he helped to pioneer and build a, a field that spanned multiple disciplines, including biostatistics, epidemiology, genetics, molecular biology, behavioral science, nutrition, and ultimately clinical trial design and research. And just this week, following me on rounds and here in the office, he's had an opportunity to do, see some of these in action. He received his medical degree at age 24, this is him in medical school, I think between third and fourth year, uh, from the State University of New York at Syracuse. And uh, following that, he received a uh, doctorate in public health from Harvard. Uh, in those days, he separated internship from residency, and after completing his internship at LA County General out here in California, he became an epidemiologic intelligence officer for the CDC. His best known published case and investigation was that of a case of anthrax in an insulation worker, which was one of the last few cases described in North America until the events of 2001. Subsequent to that, he completed a residency in Boston, at Boston City Hospital, which was one of the Harvard programs, and stayed on on faculty there before taking a position at the NCI in 1981 as a commissioned officer. He retired from NCI in 2016, having served as acting or assistant surgeon general under multiple administrations with a naval rank of two-star admiral in the USPHS branch of the HHS. At the NCI, he initiated multiple programs, including tobacco cessation programs, nutrition programs, including the Five a Day program. He established the National Black Leadership Initiative on Cancer and started a network of community oncology sites, initiating the first clinical trials in the community for cancer prevention. And you'll learn more about these this evening. During his career, he authored more than 300 scientific articles, multiple book chapters, Reflecting on the field and the advances thus far at the time in the early 90s, he remarked, everyone alive is affected by cancer. It damages the individual and the collective sense of health and well-being. Cancer prevention and control is at once both an intellectual and a practical challenge and one of the most important scientific and public health movements of this era. So, without further delay, Dr. Peter Greenwald. Uh, thank you. I'm delighted to be here and to meet with you and to see the growth of the Ridley Tree Cancer Center since I've visited a couple times before. So what will we cover? First, I wanted to say a bit about what makes for convincing evidence. What should you believe? Second, I thought we'd go into a little of the history of tobacco control because it's something we need to think about in this era where we have electronic cigarettes and marijuana coming along, and where we're going to need much better study than what we have had. Then I'll say a bit about eating behavior, including exercise, and I go over a couple of trials, and uh, these inform what we're doing. Uh, and finally, mention drugs and vaccines as cancer preventatives. We'll start, this pyramid shows the most convincing evidence is right at the top. And the reason it's a pyramid, while it's the most convincing type of evidence, a randomized controlled trial, that is placebo control where neither the participants nor the doctors know whether a drug or a vitamin are given 
That's the most convincing type of evidence. In prevention, a lot of these go many, many years. The ones I'll show you have been going 15 years. So, and we often start with something that's been around for a while because we want to be sure about safety. And, uh, but we have some hint that they may be useful. A lot of the uh, preventive things are what we would call controlled studies. And that is, you can't have a trial if it's something that might be detrimental, like smoking. And for some things like diet and health, it's very hard to, to really randomize. So that's the next best. The absolute weakest evidence is the opinion of experts when they're not based on evidence. That's what a lot of people go by, or sometimes the experts are their neighbors if it's not based on evidence that they can draw, describe to you. So let's go on to tobacco. <laughs> In 1964, there was a Surgeon General's report, the first Surgeon General's report, Luther Terry, who was appointed by President Kennedy, had uh, an expert group for two years review all the evidence and document that cigarette smoking was a cause of lung cancer. They proved it in 1964. Uh, then Kennedy died and Johnson became president. President Johnson came and spoke at the National Institutes of Health. They were funding some construction, so he spoke. Sitting behind uh, President Johnson was Luther Terry, the Surgeon General. At the end of his talk, he thanked Luther Terry, and uh, wished him the best on his retirement. To his surprise, the Surgeon General was fired for writing this report. That was the power of, of the industry lobbying. And that continued until 1981 when I came to the National Cancer Institute. Uh, we at NCI, at NCI, they had been afraid to actually fight tobacco effectively because they thought it would impact their budget because of the way that, that uh, the lobbyists were affecting Congress and Congress determining the budget for cancer research. So that, that's what went on. I changed that. What, what happened, if you looked at that point, there were a lot of studies of the causes, the causes of lung cancer, but nothing about the causes of smoking or how you could prevent it or how you could stop from smoking. So we started a whole series of studies. Actually, I recruited someone from UCLA, Joe Cullen, who was my deputy and ran the tobacco control programs. And we said, we're not going to fund the old kind anymore. We're going to fund things like school children prevention programs, prevention of smoking among women, studies of prevention of blue collar workers, minority groups, all different groups. And also, rather than working on federal regulations, because we knew it wouldn't work, we worked with the states. So we funded scientists across the country studying tobacco, but we also knew that they were the activists. There were very good people here in, in California, in Massachusetts, and a number of other states. And, and what they would do is they would affect things like clean air acts. So this room might have five exchanges of air per hour. A Clean Air Act means you need the particulate level below a certain number. And if you allow smoking, particulates go up, air conditioning bills go up, heating bills go up, so the people in charge of those places don't want smoking. And then they had a lot of smoke-free areas, smoke-free public places, rising taxes, which in California affected the rate among children. And then we went on to community-wide studies, a population study called ASSIST that affected areas of 95 million people. This is Surgeon General Coop. So, so Surgeon General Coop was appointed by President Reagan. Uh, when he first was appointed, actually, he wasn't favored at the National Institutes of Health, where he had moved in as our next-door neighbor. We lived there, and he was the house next door. So we became good friends. The reason he wasn't favored was he was very anti-abortion. That was just his beliefs. But we were close friends. We went on a cruise together for a week where we taught continuing medical education for physicians. 
His favorite was Dan, our son. And Dan would go next door and, and work with him in the evenings, getting, helping him get together his papers uh, as he published. And then, at his, Dan was in high school, then at his graduation, he got the Surgeon General to speak at his high school graduation, <laughs> to the delight of his teachers. But, but then, over time, the White House under Reagan didn't like him anymore, didn't like Coop, because he was speaking out on AIDS, and he was speaking out very effectively on tobacco. And the fact was, he had a very small staff. No one realized it. He had about five people, many of whom were doing management of the public health service, not uh, smoking control. So, so what I did with my deputy was said, let's use our support contract. We took uh, about $300,000 of our $300 million, $300 million budget, said, OK, we'll get all the background and all the information that Coop needs to be effective. And, and he was very effective. One example was, at that point, the World Health Organization in Geneva did not have an effective cancer control program. In fact, all they were doing was giving out morphine to Sri Lanka. And why Sri Lanka? Head of the program had a girlfriend there. <laughs> and, and so we said, OK, oh, Chick. We called Coop Chick. That if your last name's Coop, your nickname's Chick. Right? <laughs> and said, you set up something. We'll provide two positions to uh, Geneva, to the World Health Organization, for two years so they can create a tobacco control program. And after that, uh, they have to take it over. So we did that. He organized it. Two years went through. At the end, they reneged. But, but uh, soon after that, a, a very effective head of WHO from uh, Norway came, and they now have a good program. So we'll go on to uh, e-cigarettes. I don't have a lot to say about them. They're new. We don't have a lot of data. We know that, that there are chemicals in uh, I don't get them, propylene, glycol, glycerin, nicotine, which is addicting, uh, and other flavorings, colorings and flavorings. And there, there are different generations that came along as they had these atomizers, electrically run atomizers. And now they're even uh, a, a little, little sticks that look, look like a thumb drive that the kids use that um, here they call it vaping. So they call them vape sticks. Probably not a good picture, because I should have shown a teenager. There's a, a, literally an epidemic among teenagers using these things. A lot of them are middle and upper class, you know, your kids, educated kids in some of the schools. They have these kids vaping. We don't know, you know, we don't know whether there's harm or not harm. We have very little data. The, the National Academy of Science did a review this year, and there's definitely DNA damage that can be caused. There's quite likely reproductive effects. If a woman's pregnant, there might be adverse effects. But there's not a lot really known. Uh, and and uh, then marijuana, same thing. While it was illegal, it could not be studied. We know there are carcinogens there, but there's no proof of cancer uh, or harm. We know people inhale deeply. Uh, it took 20 years or so. If you do a prospective study where you follow a large population for a long time, which is the type of evidence we had with smoking, we won't know for 20 years, perhaps the really definitive information. So all we really know about harm is it's not good to combine alcohol and then drive a car, but, but there's very little evidence one way or the other. We just don't have it. We know that there's some advantages in maybe pain management and withdrawal from opioids, but, but other than that, epilepsy perhaps. But um, there, there's some potential risks, and we're just not sure. We don't know. Want to go on to eating behavior. And I'm going to start with a clinical trial that a group of us, several of us at the National Cancer Institute, did jointly with, chi with scientists in China. So we're in this, it's called a commune, a village, a rural village in China. And, and uh, this is just a picture of what the village looked like. We started in the early 1980s. Trial still, there's still follow-up going on today. Uh, this is, an er they had a, I would say a borderline deficient diet. So their diet's not as good as your diet. It's borderline deficient. And here's what we're studying. 
vitamins and minerals where there's a borderline deficient diet. And I want to pay attention to this, the selenium, beta, carotene, and vitamin E. I'm just going to describe this part of the diet in a group of 30,000 people that were participants. Very well controlled diet. We, when we started it, we spiked the pills with riboflavin and proved they had very good compliance. It was very carefully done. So here's the end result after 15 years. I'm going to show you the 15-year result. First of all, the study was of cancer of the esophagus. Initially, we thought it was all cancer of the esophagus, of the throat. And, and uh, when we got there and got into it, a very large, maybe over a third, was cancer of the upper part of the stomach because they had the same symptoms. So when we analyzed, we separated the two. And a lot of the studies going on now are molecular genetic studies of those things. And if you look, for example, gastric cancer, it was about a fifth, we prevented about a fifth of stomach cancer in this trial. And there were other benefits, total mortality down. Now I'm going to show you a slide, and I'll go over it. This is the number of deaths. Think of that as deaths, and this is years. The intervention went on for five years. So from here to the arrow is five years. And then there was 10 years of follow-up where we were not giving anything more. So I didn't put the arrow on all the other slides, but they're all the same. Five years intervention, either placebo or pills, and then 10 years of follow-up. And, and this is the younger group, which were about 40 to 54 years old, and these are the people 55 and over. That, oh, the blue line is the placebo, the upper line. So in this case, there are more deaths in those on placebo than those on the intervention. Okay, and the same here. So you can see for total deaths, total mortality, no change during the trial for the younger people. Ten years later, you see a benefit. So if you intervened when the, in the younger group, those under 55, there was a benefit that you saw develop after. And in the older people, no benefit, no, no benefit, no harm. Now, this is the cancer deaths. Roughly the same thing. Not much of a change during the intervention, not statistically significant. Then it became very significant way later. And, and altogether, of the 30,000 people, there were something like 9,700 deaths. So there's a tremendous amount of power in the study. No effect on the older people. Here's the stomach cancer deaths. A benefit here, placebo intervention, 20% decrease in the number of deaths. So we prevented 20% of the stomach cancer. Uh, it, wasn't, it looks like there's a hint of a benefit in the older, but it was not statistically significant. And finally, esophageal, which is a bit of a paradox. Here's the clear benefit, clear benefit in the younger people. I don't know if you can see. You see placebo is below here. It's a paradox. It looked a little bit worse in the older people. And, and there's another factor that's associated with stomach cancer, Helicobacter pylori, an, an infection that causes inflammation in the stomach and contributes to the development of stomach cancer. Same thing, that it contributes to the development of stomach cancer and there's an inverse association with esophageal cancer. So, so what are the lessons? And I think it's the only study you know that has these kind of data that, that we develop. But it suggests, one, what you eat, what you do in midlife may be the most important, and it, the benefit can carry on later in life. That, and that you've got to be careful. You can't just look at one organ. You better pay attention to the overall, the total effect. And in most of our studies, we pay attention to heart disease, everything not just what we're aiming to study. I'm going to mention one other trial that's ongoing. It's been going on for 15 years uh, by two people at Harvard, uh, Joanne Manson and Julie Burring. I meet with them twice a year uh, with the Data Safety and Monitoring Board. I still do, even though I'm retired. So they're giving 
in, in about 25,000 people over that. Vitamin D or omega-3 fatty acids, fat, fish oils. Fish oils are vitamin D. And they're studying, and it only shows two things, how they randomize vitamin D or placebo for vitamin D, fatty acids, placebo, fatty acids, placebo. And either these are the blister packs, so the 25,000 people get these. This little one is either vitamin D or placebo for vitamin D. This one is either uh, the, the omega-3 fatty acids or placebo for fatty acids. I think this trial is important. As I look at the current data, this trial's not done. Uh, my guess is the first reports might be by the end of this year, the end of 2008, but we'll have to see. I'm pretty sure they'll be done by then. So I can't report on the result. As I look at existing data, omega-3 fatty acids is pretty solid. Vitamin D is it's not the de most definitive type of evidence. a little shaky to me. but. Uh, and you see doctors giving all sorts of recommendations. So we'll know better, because this will be the definitive trial by far. That's uh, Joanne and Julie. There's a lot of communication back and forth with the participants. They do a lot of this by mail, and they keep in touch with everyone. OK, let's go on now to, well, what do we know about what you should do? So. This was uh, 1987, a, a, study, a public health project that's still going on. I knew a lot about health agencies, state health agencies. So we set aside some funds for state health agencies to come in with evidence-based public health interventions that might help against cancer. And two people from California, uh, Sue Forrester, who worked with the health department, and Laurel Idasorga, who worked with Dole, Pi Dole Pineapple, came in with an idea of called five a day, of eat at least five servings of vegetables and fruits a day. And, and we liked the idea, so we worked with them, worked off the California license, modified the program, and made it nationwide. We invited uh, industry, the food, uh, the uh, fruit, industry and vegetable industry and the supermarkets to take part with us. And they did. In fact, they came in and after we talked it over, they said, oh, you're too slow, government. In about a week, a week and a half, they formed a, a corporation, a foundation, Five a Day for Better Health Foundation that collected $400,000 in a week, basically. And, and we started this program where we, we at NCI were the ones that decided what could be counted as a vegetable, uh, and they would do the marketing. So, for example, you could count a baked potato, but not a French fry. You could count something with vegetables in, but not if it was also laden with fat. So it had to be healthful on the side of health. Within six months, there were six billion, six billion gross impressions. In marketing, that means one person seeing one ad one time. So if you went in the market and pulled off a plastic bag and it had five a day stamped on it, that's what it was. 80% of the supermarkets in the United States and 80% of the food and at, uh, the uh, fruit and vegetable marketers were part of this program. And I still see it in markets today. I'm sure it's been widely used here in Santa Barbara. Serving size is important. So in, I think it was about the year 2000, I called, I telephoned Syracuse, China. Syracuse, New York, there's a company, was a company, that made plates for restaurants and, and uh, hotels. They made all these plates. And I said, help me, about 10 years before, what were the plate sizes? And the appetizer plate was six inches in diameter. And the main course was nine inches in diameter. And you figure sort of a pyramid of food. It's a huge difference in volume of food. One of our big problems is the marketing of volume as a value. Whether it, you go to a restaurant, you might as well uh, ask for one portion for two people or even three people. The, the appetizers are big and the, the like 12 inches sometimes. Also sorts of shapes. So we're eating too much. 
and we're drinking too much. So when I was little, a cup was eight ounces, right? And then you can buy a Coke that was less than 12 ounces. The cans were all 12 ounces. And then they went up to about 20 ounces. A child can go to a movie, go to a film, and get a, actually a 30 ounce of uh, Coke, uh, sugar, water, and caffeine. It's a problem. We have a huge obesity problem. Obesity contributes to several types of cancer, as well as heart disease, diabetes, other adverse effects, arthritis. So that's what we need to pay attention to. I'm, I'm not going to go over the trials of physical activity, <laughs> but you probably know, uh, a lot of people know that no matter what your age, you should exercise, and yet not too many do it. Uh, it's important to exercise. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, now I want to uh, move on. And, and talk about uh, therap uh, prevention trials using drugs. So, so th this fellow is Dr. Bernard Fisher, uh, who developed a, a nationwide network of surgeons called NSABP, or their initials. And they did some of the, many of the most important breast cancer therapy and prevention trials ever done. So for example, he was the first one that proved that a partial operation could, was often effective in breast cancer treatment. You didn't have to do a debilitating radical mastectomy. He proved it at a time when doctors thought he was a quack for doing that, that he wasn't removing the whole breast that they thought you needed to do. And, and uh, the women are, are women taking part in the first breast cancer prevention trial. So we sponsored the trial. I worked with them a lot. And, and the trial was a drug called tamoxifen, which some of you know is used in therapy. It had been used already in adjuvant therapy, that it, it was given to women with a localized breast cancer to try to prevent recurrence. And in one of their, the therapy trials, one called B14, it was seen that new breast cancers in the opposite breast were about half as common as those uh, that were on the placebo. So, so tamoxifen in early breast cancer treatment resulted in fewer new breast cancers in the operation. That was the strongest rationale that we had for saying, well, let's do a prevention trial. And, and so led by Fisher's group, but a national trial was done with about 13,000 women. Before the trial was started, the head of the National Institutes of Health and I had to testify in Congress about it in a hardball hearing. All the questions actually were for me. And, and the reason was they said, why are you doing this trial, giving a drug to some women where we know there are a few side effects? It's quite a safe drug, but there are a few side effects and, and something that could hurt them. So I defended that, and I'll touch on that a little later with prostate cancer. Uh, so that was the study. And the prevention trial showed that breast cancer occurrence was cut in half for those on tamoxifen. It, what was cut were the estrogen receptor positive, but it, the total breast cancer was cut in half. The ductal non-invasive, DCIS it's called, was cut in half. And there was a reduction in fractures. There was a, a little increase in endometrial cancer, none of it fatal. And as with all estrogens, basically, there were some more blood clots in the legs and things. But, but it's, the drug is an estrogenic type drug, so that was not surprising, any estrogen. So there was a clear benefit, a bit of risk. Our, our, some statisticians at NCI calculated based on demographics and benefit risk that the lower bound was at least 28,000 up to about 50,000 breast cancers could be prevented a year where the benefit outweighed the risk if women did it. It never really took hold though, even though Eli Lilly marketed it. Physicians, some, but not too many bought in, but it could prevent a lot. And then there was another trial I won't go into, but called STAR, where this drug was compared to one called raloxifene, and it showed the same benefit. 
and maybe a slightly better profile of benefit risk. That's probably the one more often recommended. Uh, you don't have to worry about this. So it's a prostate cancer prevention trial. So there's a drug called finasteride, Proscar. Uh, Trump puts it on his head. <laughs> in, in, in small doses, it's supposed to prevent hair loss, but I don't think it worked on him. <laughs> so, so this is testosterone. There's an enzyme that prevents it from going to a much more potent uh, androgen called dihydrotestosterone in the prostate gland. And this drug had already been used for treatment of enlarged prostate, that for men who tru had trouble urinating because of pressure from the prostate gland. And, and we thought, in talking with uh, Merck, who made it, uh, that it might be useful to test for prevention of prostate cancer. Uh, one problem was we wanted to oversample black men because they get more prostate cancer. And so um, we did this trial of 18,000 men. Uh, but we knew that, that a lot of the black men and the black urologists knew about Tuskegee, if you know this uh, study of, of black men that were followed for syphilis. And even when a therapy became available, it was ignored because they wanted to look at the natural history of syphilis. So it was a huge ethical problem in the 1930s. So we were going to sample. And of course, when we start a trial, we never know if it's going to be better or worse, something we call equipoise. Because if we knew, we wouldn't do the trial. The solution was, OK, Peter, <laughs> my, the women and the younger people on my staff said, no problem. You go on the trial. And if it comes off wrong, uh, you can go to Congress and say, uh, well, you knew the potential risks and the potential benefit, and uh, we'll be OK. So I did. So I went on the trial. Actually, I went to Walter Reed uh, Medical Center. And uh, during the trial, you'd have a lot of blood tests. You'd be taking these pills. You didn't know if it was the drug or whether it was placebo. About halfway through, my nurse said, uh, you know, you, you had a blood test and a rectal exam. Uh, so you had a rectal exam every year uh, to feel the size of the prostate with there are any nodes. And my nurse said, uh, Peter, uh, you're going to get a new doctor. But don't worry, she has small fingers. <laughs> so, uh, and, and then at the end, we, we, everyone would get a biopsy, no matter what their PSA, which gave us an extremely valuable set of prostate tissue for molecular and other studies that we never had before on people that had, say, below a PSA of four. So I went to get the biopsies, which are done after an enema through the rectum with a 18-gauge needle, at least six of them. It doesn't, I didn't take any of these, it doesn't hurt. But, but the, it's sort of like if you hit your hand with a pen or something. I mean, it's quick, it's spring gauge. They did six then, now they're doing 10 or 12. Uh, and, and, but the uh, urologist, to take this, asked the nurse what my PSA was. They weren't supposed to tell me. But, but she said 0 0.5. I knew right then I was on the drug, finasteride. I know it, of course. So the trial showed a 25% 25 25 reduction in the occurrence rate of prostate cancer. So there was a clear benefit. Unfortunately, in those on the finasteride, there was a somewhat higher number that had a higher grade prostate cancer called, according to something called the Gleason score. I'm not sure that's valid when you're on finasteride, because that can distort it. And here's one possible explanation. There are other ones. That is, the drug shrinks the gland by about a quarter. So if it shrinks the normal prostate, but not any cancerous spots, when you do the biopsies, you're more likely to hit the cancerous spots. And, and all our studies that were carefully done by the pathologists those on finasteride, even in spite of this Gleason score, had smaller tumors, tumors more often localized to one globe. But the FDA committee did not approve it, so, and that was a blow. I thought they were wrong, uh, 
it because the people on the committee only had one guy, supposedly on prevention, who kept his mouth shut. And he only knew about GI cancers anyway. And, and uh, the drug is widely used, somewhat widely used, uh, for pr enlarged prostate and approved for that. So if you have a drug approved for that, why would you not approve it for cancer prevention? Uh, at least selectively. Anyhow, that, that discouraged some of the investigators and drug companies from saying we're going to do, do more studies of prevention with these drugs because they're expensive and long term, a lot of work. Let's just touch on environment. I guess I have some time. So uh, the, the issues are, I'm not going to go into detail, but um, we live on a fragile planet. And it, it's important to keep the planet clean. You want your ocean off here clean. You want clean air, clean water. Uh, most of the environmental studies that show adverse effects are in workers that have fairly heavy exposures, whether it's asbestos, dye industry, a number of different things. Uh, so, so we know that you know, farmers can get exposures. They're heavy exposures. But what we don't really know and have a really no good way to study except for identifying the chemicals and whether in sublethal doses they cause cancer in mice or something like that. Uh, we don't have good data one way or the other. Uh, the only dump I really studied myself or supervisor and fellow who worked with me was the Love Canal. In, in, uh, the Love Canal is a toxic dump in Niagara Falls, New York. So in 1890, an entrepreneur named William Love uh, built a canal to move water from the escarpment of the high part of, of Niagara Falls to a place where there was an industrial city. And uh, Tesla, Nikola Tesla, who was a giant in electricity, also lived in that area. And while he built the canal to do that, then Tesla developed alternating current. And alternating current allowed power to go long distances over wires. So the canal was no longer needed for power to be transmitted. So then they emptied out part of the canal, and different companies, Hooker Chemical and others, uh, put these barrels of toxic chemicals into the dried canal, covered it up. <coughs> and then, even though they were warned against this, houses were built over it. Elementary school was built over it. Uh, over time, because of heavy rains and snows and the drums corroding, chemicals came up to the surface. And uh, there were a lot of chemicals there on the surface. So also, the health commissioner of New York State, in order to get federal funding, had to use very specific wording. I don't remember the exact word, but something like great and imminent disaster. So here in the newspapers, the health commissioner is saying there's a great and imminent disaster from all these chemicals in the Love Canal. It scared the life out of the people that lived there. There was a huge national scandal. The, the lab people could prove there were 75, a little over 75 dioxins and other toxic chemicals. So we knew for sure there were all these chemicals there. But I was supervising and doing a bit. On the human studies, we couldn't prove anything. <laughs> they, they were so much faster. And we compared the people living there to uh, the neighbor areas and other areas that were equivalent. And, and uh, there were some maybe low birth weight children born, but not any different than other areas of the same lower kind of socioeconomic level. We could not prove more cancer. But, but as with many of these dumps, they're not the kind of thing you want around. You don't want to, you're better not to have them. And this costs, uh, over over 100 million, I think, now for the cleanup. And uh, it was just a mess. Well, what about vaccines? Uh, there are two vaccines that are preventing some cancers. The first was hepatitis B vaccine. And, and the vaccinating infants, young children with it, uh, before they get exposed, will prevent a lot of liver cancer later on in life. And the other one, which two of my colleagues at the National Cancer Institute developed, 
was the human papillomavirus vaccine. So it's a virus that, that looks a little like a soccer ball, an infinitely small soccer ball, with the oncogenic, de the cancer-producing DNA inside this soccer ball that has 75 little things around it. And so what they figured out was they could take the gene that make the capsule, the envelope, without the genes in it that make the DNA that causes cancer. And that's basically the vaccine. They figured out that if they put those genes into a, a morph larva, that they would self-replicate and you'd go to this vaccine. And they have the patents on the vaccine. And now, uh, you know, all your children, starting at maybe about age 12, boys and girls, boys too, because they call it not only cancer of the cervix, but anus, mouth, uh, they should be vaccinated with this. And, and there's probably we'll get to a vaccine against hepatitis C fairly soon within the next few years. It's a much different virus. They sound the same, but hepatitis B is a DNA virus. C is an RNA virus. They're not the same. They just sound the same. Not the same. <laughs> much bigger problem with the, C vi with the uh, RNA viruses. Uh, whether we'll be able to get other vaccines at this point is un uncertain. You probably know there's an explosion in how immunology is affecting cancer therapeutics and, and every disease therapeutics. Have. And uh, a lot of these drugs that have very dramatic effects in certain people that have the right target, <coughs> excuse me, it, it kind of wipes out the cancer, at least for a while, uh, or has a big effect. Whether that can be backed off into preventive, we'll have to see. Uh, now there's still side effects. We'll have to get to the point, as we did with, with uh, breast cancer with tamoxifen, where there's adjuvant therapy that prevents it, where we not have a lot known about safety and whether the expense is down, where maybe it could be oral. So it'd be a long way to go, but it's, it's a potential that we could get there. Here's what I see as key points for the future. One, all the modern technology will inform prevention as well as it does every other aspect of therapeutics and health, cancer and every other disease. So whether it's biochemistry, whether it's it, uh, nutritional science, which needs more genetics and more foundation. Second, the biomarkers, I think this is one of the most important markers of exposure are markers that predict what will happen in the future. And if you modify the marker, you, you uh, modify the disease occurrence. So the best example that you're fully aware of is in heart disease. The marker is high blood pressure or one of the cholesterol fractions. So you have something, a number actually, that's easily understood that changed the whole field of cardiology to where there was an interest in prevention because people would know a lot about their risk and they would know they could lower the risk. So that's what we're aiming for. Uh, I set up a, an early detection research network which aims to develop biomarkers and validate them. It's still in progress. One interesting thing is in doing it, we set up a, a collaboration with the Jet Propulsion Lab, the Jet Propulsion Lab in Pasadena. Uh, and the reason was uh, they have the same problem we have. We have all these professors and postdocs all across the country doing studies. We have to figure out how do you pull it together, integrate it, and make sure you understand it. So they have the same problem. We use their, their solar system platform rather than the Earth or outer space, their solar system, and work together with their mathematicians, computer people. And they have the problem, all these people across the country looking at data, and they have to figure out what, how do you make sense out of it. So, we're collaborating with the Jet Propulsion Lab. Uh, clinical trials, uh, you saw a couple of examples of them. They're the most definitive, most important thing we can do, but they're only part of the totality of evidence. We also have to look at, at uh, other methods of basic science and as well as clinical evidence. And it's important to communicate what we know in a way that people understand it and feel that they want to act on the information, behavior change. So anyway, thank you.